Hey, good morning again, or whatever time of day or night it is that you're watching this video. And thank you for watching again. I really do appreciate it. I'm continuing on my geological adventures here in Wyoming, the Cowboy State, possibly the greatest state there is. No offense to anybody else, but come on, it's Wyoming. <laughs> And I've stopped in Rollins, Wyoming, which a lot of times people just zip by on I-80 on their way to Yellowstone or West California or East. This is a major thoroughfare across the continent. I-80 is a major route. And it's been that way for centuries, millennia. The native tribes used to live here, used it as a passageway because there's mountains to the north, the granite mountains, the wind rivers, mountains to the south, Sierra Madre, Medicine Bows, and this is a nice, plain you can just get across the bison used to hang out here it's a pretty straightforward place without having to go up and down all kinds of hill and dale it made sense that when union pacific decided to put a train from east coast to west coast they would use this path and there's all sorts of commemorative boxcars and cabooses scattered through the various towns that attest to that rollins interestingly enough has the state prison you know, Cheyenne is the capital, that's in the eastern part of the state. Then Laramie has the university, Rollins got the prison, that's where they broke it up and uh, when Wyoming was establishing who gets what. So each town got one major thing and Rollins scored the prison. Also interestingly, uh, Laramie is about 90 miles away from Rollins, which is 90 miles away from um, Rock Springs, which is 90 miles away from Evanston. They're each about 90 miles because that's how far a railroad could go before it needed to stop for coal. So your location of these towns is dictated by how far a train could go before they had to stop for coal to get the steam going. Cheyenne and Laramie are closer together because there's a huge elevation differential between them and the trains have to climb from Cheyenne to Laramie. Wow, who knew all these interesting things? You do now. Back to Rollins. It was originally called Rollins Springs and it's got a really interesting history. Rollins Springs is named for a guy named General Rollins, who was on the expeditionary force when they were clearing the way for the Union Pacific, meaning all the natives that lived here for years and years and generations were being cleared out. It's a, not a bright spot in US history, but it happened. And as they were clearing the way, they were making little camps as they moved progressively west. And there was a general named Dodge who was in charge of this one. And he had his buddy with him, General Rollins, and they stopped here and General Rollins took a drink from the springs that are right behind me in this park. Not a really nice looking little park, it's kind of sad, but this is where it happened. He took a drink from the springs and said, mmm, that's mighty good. I think he actually said that it's the most gracious and acceptable water he had had on the whole expedition. And he said, you know, if anybody ever names anything after me, I hope it's a spring. Whereupon General Dodge apparently turned to him and said, you got it, buddy. We're calling this Rollins Springs. Presto, it's called Rollins Springs. Later they drop the springs. It's just called Rollins. Equally interesting, and just as related to uh, geological processes as the natural springs that are down below here, is the outcrop behind me. That's actually Cambrian. That's really, really ancient stuff. That's Cambrian flathead sandstone. And you see it's got a kind of reddish color to it. That's a lot of iron oxide. Now, the iron oxide, as it happens in the 1800s, was discovered to be really good as an ingredient in paint that was used on exteriors of buildings. You've all heard probably of the Little Red Schoolhouse. Everybody knows barns are red. If you go anywhere in the world, especially in European countries, a lot of barns to this day are bright red. It's a color called Rollins Red, and it was mined right here in Rollins, Wyoming. So the iron oxide mines just north of town were the source of iron oxide for these red paints that became synonymous with little red schoolhouses, red barns, and even the Brooklyn Bridge. I'd never do this. I'm from Brooklyn originally. I used to cross over the Brooklyn Bridge with my family when we'd go into Manhattan. We'd go to the museum, learn all about dinosaurs, all this fantastic stuff. I never realized until I was reading about it online, the wonders of the internet, that the Brooklyn Bridge in the original schematics and the original diagram, it was to be painted Rollins red. Wow. It's because the oxide is a good protectant against peeling, flaking, and deterioration of the paint. So Rollins, Wyoming, named for General Rollins, who found the water gracious and acceptable, and with its red Cambrian sandstones and claystones, is providing the color for things like the Brooklyn Bridge. 
So there are a few spots in town we can actually get a close-up look at that Cambrian sandstone, the flathead. I'm going to run and do that. Let's take a look at it and see what kind of environment it was formed in, because that's always a fun part. And basically, that's the main reason I'm out here, is to look at depositional environments and interpret paleo environments from the rocks. So there's the rocks. Let's go see what we see. So here I am in Rollins. I'm on the western part of town. Um, there's a Sinclair gas station right here, uh, even though the town of Sinclair is just a couple of miles up the road. But be that as it may, this is Rollins. And behind me is the Cambrian Flathead Sandstone. Now, unfortunately, the lighting isn't perfect right now. This is a north-facing outcrop, and the sun is to the south because it's middle September. If I came here maybe in May or June, um, it'd be a little bit better. But you can still see the nature of the outcrop behind me. It's a big, thick pile of sand. That reddish material that gives us um, the Rollins red color, the iron oxide silt and clay, is stratigraphically above this, and it's weathered out here. And you know, the Cambrian is a really interesting time in Earth's history because on land, there's no plants, there's no animals, there's really not much of anything at all. Um, all life is in the oceans. There's algae, uh, there was the Cambrian explosion, all kinds of crazy um, invertebrates and ancestors of chordates. But on land, there was no vegetation to regulate fluvial systems or terrestrial ecosystems at all. So the sediments behaved completely independently of any sort of life processes that we have today. In that way, it's very similar to the deposits we're seeing on Mars. So the Cambrian is potentially a really good insight into what Martian landscape was like. Let's take a look at the Cambrian and see what we see in these deposits. I'm in the lower part of that outcrop, and you can see it's a very heterolithic unit. It's clay, silt, sand. I've chewed my way through it. Um, the clay is this kind of greenish material. And then there's silt and sand, there's some ripples, there's some undulatory bedding, some parallel bedding. It looks a lot like what you'd expect to see in the distal part of a delta, a pro-delta, distal delta front, something like that. Um, lacustrine, marine, not really sure about that, can't tell from this. Um, Keep looking around, see if there's any trace fossils. There's marine animals that might have been leaving little burrows in this that might give us a hint. But this looks like a subaqueous deposit anyway, something deltaic. Um, no hummocks, no swales, nothing that looks like storm deposits yet. But let's take a look higher up and see what we see. Okay, so fortunately these beds are kind of tilted this direction. So as I walk lengthwise, I'm going up section. Look what I just spotted, nice big cross bedding in this sandstone. The sandstone's almost a quartzite at this point. Uh, it has been buried so deep and compacted under so much pressure, it's been partially metamorphosed. But there's big cross bedding in this, going in that direction, going roughly uh, west, it looks like. So we've got what looks like um, subaqueous deposits down below, maybe a distal delta front, um, pro delta, and then we start seeing big cross bed of sand like this, which is typical of you know, traction currents coming off the nose of a delta. So if you have a deltaic system spewing sediment from the east, you know, maybe the ancestral Rockies spewing sediment out, that sand builds up traction currents and you get these thick beds of, uh, of essentially subaqueous dunes creating the delta front itself. So we might be getting up into the delta front. Okay, so I just noticed something interesting when I took a step back. That's why it's always good to take a step back and look at the outcrop. That first thick, massive cross-bedded sandstone there, if you follow it across, you can see the cross-bedding, but look at the shape of that body. It actually pinches out there. It narrows down to almost nothing. So you're seeing preserved a single complete bed form, a single dune that's migrating in this direction, and you're actually even seeing the end of that dune where it stops. There's a sharp boundary underneath it, and that sharp boundary continues all the way across, and then there's massive sand on top, and there's that heterolithic material down below. Now, I'm standing by my interpretation that that heterolithic material below is subaqueous, but I got another idea of what it might actually be. Not necessarily marine, not necessarily lacustrine, sort of lacustrine, because it looks like ever so slightly peeking out below to some more massive sand. Now, this cross-bedded sandstone above which is just a stack of sand on sand on sand, is typical of an amalgamated fluvial system where you have sandy bars 
chopping one in front of the other, one on top of the other, back and forth, and stacking sand on sand on sand. When a channel is abandoned, when that channel belt avulses, you have the hole that's left to fill in with overbank material and flood deposits, you get a subaqueous lacustrine deposit, an oxbow lake, which can fill in with sand, silt, mud, clay, all the fine grained stuff that happens during a flood event, and it gets bypassed out of the main channel, gets trapped in this little oxbow, which otherwise is full of standing water, and you create a facies that looks not unlike that. So I'm going to revise my interpretation and say instead of shallow marine or lacustrine, it's sort of lacustrine, it's an oxbow lake, though it's an abandoned channel fill surrounded by fluvial channel belts on either side. Let's walk along and see if we see any scouring in there. There might be some scouring. Okay, here we go. Here's what I was looking for. Here's a little scour at the base of one of these sand bodies, consistent with a fluvial channel cutting into a previously laid deposit. In this case, that previous deposit is that heterolithic facies that I'm um, hypothesizing is an abandoned channel fill. And it would make sense when another channel avulses and slices into it, it would leave evidence of that in the form of a scour. It's a very small one, the exposure is not great, but it's there and it continues on off that way. So here we go. Our working hypothesis for this outcrop of the flathead sandstone might be that we've got a big amalgamated sandy fluvial system with big dunes. Some of them are you know, fairly significant in height. That one back there was about a foot and a half tall. You know, what is that, like 50 centimeters? Multiply that by about 10. That gives you approximate flow depth. So let's say a foot and a half times 10, that's 18 inches, 180 inches. So, you know, we're talking about 10, 12, 15 feet of flow. Um, you know, 60 centimeters times 10 is about six meters. So that's pretty significant flow depth. The abandoned channel fill should be about that deep. You would expect about six meters of abandoned channel fill, which would continue on down here. And then of course it's topped off by that fine grain oxidized silt and mud that's giving us the Rollins red color. All right, not a bad bit of exploration of an outcrop in the town of Rollins. Incidentally, this is the exact same outcrop you can see from the park and the Union Pacific Railway cuts through it just this side of the outcrop. So this is the exact same outcrop we were seeing from back in the park. I hope you enjoyed this little side visit to an interesting little town in Wyoming and exploring the history of Rollins Red, the Cambrian, Union Pacific Railway, all these things that are tied together. It's a pretty fascinating story when you get out here and start exploring. Never stop exploring. Thank you very much for watching. I really genuinely appreciate it. And I'll see you next time on The Outcrop. Take care.